St. Mary's Baptist Church, uh, which I understand is on the site of where we were for uh, a lunch and then tea. And uh, was here pretty well all of his, uh, he only had this one pastor. It came in the, would have been the 15, uh, sorry, 1780s. Uh, he had studied at Bristol Baptist College. He was from Northern England and uh, stayed here till his death in 1832. Uh, he was a major, major figure in the history of uh, Norwich. Uh, he was a key figure in the Baptist of the day. So when the uh, Baptist Missionary Society, for example, was being formed and Andrew Fuller was the secretary, and they had sent William Carey to India in 1793. Uh, Fuller wanted to recruit uh, uh, Kinghorn's help, knowing the influence that Kinghorn would have upon the Norfolk churches. Uh, Kinghorn uh, eventually did come around to to supporting the society, a pretty strong support of the society. But uh, interestingly enough, despite his uh, reputation as a very influential, godly, uh, orthodox minister in Norfolk, many of the Norfolk churches and Suffolk churches did not come around to the support of the Missionary Society. One of the uh, challenges of Baptists in uh, Kinghorn's day uh, was the twin peril of hyper-Calvinism and antinomianism. And uh, there were some of the churches in uh, Norfolk and Suffolk who were hyper-Calvinist and did not believe in what we call the free offer of the gospel and uh, felt that Fuller, by defending it, had violated the canons of orthodoxy and thus failed to support him. But King Owen became a fairly close friend, raising money for the Baptist Missionary Society here. King Owen also had uh, his hands in a number of other so-called fires. He had a kind of an eclectic society, if you know anything about John Newton, John Newton used to have a society of ministers in London who would discuss, who would meet on a monthly basis and they would discuss a variety of things. They spend an evening talking. And uh, Kinghorn started the same here. Uh, it seemed to be more broader, though, than Newton's. Newton's, generally speaking, would be uh, or, uh, evangelical Anglicans, whereas Kinghorn would include the Unitarian minister and a variety of others, and they would uh, gather to discuss theology on a regular basis. Uh, King Owen was, th uh, there were two attempts to bring him, uh, to remove him from here in the sense of uh, uh, places trying to call him. Uh, the, uh, what becomes uh, the Regent's Park College in Oxford was originally started as Stepney in London uh, in 1810, and there is an attempt to call him on that occasion. Uh, there's an enormous amount of correspondence goes back and forth uh, between the trustees. They're convinced that uh, Kinghorn's their man. And uh, Kinghorn was pretty committed to the local church and ministry within that body, and thus he stays. And then there was a later attempt to bring him uh, back to the northern England, he, where he was native, uh, in this case in Yorkshire, uh, where the Northern Baptist Theological Sem or Seminary was formed, or what would later be known as Rodden. Uh, and that also comes to naught. Um, dies in 1832. His biography is written by a prominent, uh, uh, what would you say, no, you wouldn't say Norwichian, would you? What's a, what's a, what's a native of Norwich? Norwich uh, a Norwichent? Norwichent? Norwich? Nov oh, it's a kind of a V sound. Novacentian. Okay, good. So, uh, a prominent Novacentian named Martin Wilkin wrote his biography. Uh, it's a fascinating biography in many ways, a bit of a frustrating biography. He confesses at the beginning of the book that he had tons of uh, Kinghorn's letters. Uh, Kinghorn never married and thus kept up a very lively correspondence with his father all his life, David Kinghorn. And uh, Wilkin confesses that uh, he had gone through the letters, taken out the most spiritual parts, and burned the rest of them, and, uh, which is just a travesty. I mean, the Victorians uh, had no idea, really, when they were including letters in books. Uh, the editorial practice that they did, from our standpoint, is just absolutely, utterly, totally appalling. Uh, anyway, that, there, there is a standard biography. 
Um, he's been ignored uh, over the last probably 100 years or so. There's virtually nothing done on him in the 20th century. And that, that's a real shame. Uh, there were some articles in the Baptist Quarterly. But he's a very, very prominent figure. Uh, very learned. Um, at uh, Bristol Baptist College, he would have had Greek and Hebrew. He teaches himself Latin, Syriac. Uh, and would have had some access to French and German as well. And... Um, so quite, a, quite an important figure in this part of England, and there really needs to be a, a theological biography of him. He had a lot of contacts with uh, a number of the evangelical Quakers in the city, like the Gurneys, um, was involved, obviously, in the Baptist Missionary Society, theological education, the, the big uh, battle against the ethical uh, issue of the day, uh, the slave trade, and so. Yeah, I, anyway. Yeah, he's, he's apparently, I, I didn't realize this, if when you go over, when we went over there, we actually all went over his grave. Uh, there's a cross right at the, the steps uh, of um, what was St. Mary's Baptist Chapel, I guess it's Central Baptist now, and that signifies where he's buried. And so we all walked over that. And, and when, they, when they rebuilt the building, they found his grave. And... Um, put it back, and uh, anyway, so. Okay, so that's a little bit about Kinghorn, and um, so I, I, uh, I'll need to get an invite to come back so I could do a lecture on Kinghorn. Yeah, I, I, yeah Kinghorn's long been a favor of mine, uh, but I've, you know, you've only got so much time and other people, you know, take your attention. Thankfully, uh, particularly Baptist Press in uh, Springfield, Missouri, have reprinted all of his works, including the biography. Uh, they've not reprinted his... Oh, the other big thing was his big quarrel with Robert Hall Jr. Robert Hall Jr., who was probably the most spectacular preacher of the day, a big celebrity. And the issue was closed communion and whether or not an unbaptized believer could partake of the Lord's Supper in a, a Kinghorn's church. And Kinghorn argued very vehemently for closed communion. And Robert Hall was open communion. It was a massive uh, battle. And uh, that battle raised all through the 19th century in Baptist circles and was eventually resolved in some ways by Charles Spurgeon, who was closed membership. You had to be a baptized believer to be a member of his church, but you, anybody could partake of the, of the supper who was walking with the Lord. So King Home would not have liked that. But anyway. Well, any, any other questions? Uh, that might have arisen from this morning or this afternoon. Well, that's a very good question. Um, a Bri- before I, I didn't mention, before Bridge died uh, by 1649, so by that point Bridge is in his late 40s, uh, his works are being collected and published. And there's a number of those collections that went on uh, during the 1650s, 1660s, which is quite remarkable. Owen's works were not collected until the 19th century. Well, there might have been something in the 18th, but it's not till the 19th century. Um, I think the decision, the publishing decision of the Banner of Truth, I, I think it really comes down to that to some degree, um, uh, was critical now. Um, all, pretty well all the Puritans were um, not really heavily studied during the first third, uh, half of the 20th century. Um, the attitude toward, of a lot of historians towards them was that they were simply a relic of the past and really had little, little to say to us. Uh, these are church historians. And I think the decision of the Banner of Truth to reprint the collected works of Owen, I mean, they, I don't know how many times that, that set's been reprinted, innumerable times. They haven't, uh, I think there's one uh, printing of Bridges. It's a five-volume set. Um, so I think, I think that's a big, that's, that's significant. And then Ohm was pretty heavily read by the 18th century. So Andrew Fuller, uh, for instance, who is, the, who is the main theological figure between 1780 and 1890. Pretty well every Baptist in England, except for the, well, the group that we know as the strict and particular Baptist and the Gospel Standard. I noticed that right next door to 
St. Mary's is the Gospel Standard Zohar Chapel. Uh, apart from them, they're all Fullerites. And Fuller was deeply influenced by Owen. He had two main mentors, Owen and Edwards, Jonathan Edwards. And uh, I don't think Owen, I don't think Fuller read Bridge, for example. So Owen, Owen becomes a, Owen is transmitted because significant people are reading him who become important for the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, it's certainly not because of his biography, uh, Owen's biography. Owen's biography is very difficult to do. Uh, he, does, he doesn't give us any really personal information, as I mentioned. And um, so... Well, I think Owen combines, yeah, Owen, 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 first of all, Owen, like most of the Puritans, this would be true of Bridge, uh, this is not true of Baxter, and it's not true of Bunyan, but Owen had a first-class education, uh, pretty well all the Puritans did. So that first-class education gave Owen a familiarity with and a, an ability to engage with uh, the theological categories that had basically being part of Western theological thought from the Reformation all the way back through the Middle Ages into the Fathers. So Owen is familiar with that entire tradition. With Baxter, he's not. And Baxter, at times, I think, is confused theologically because he, he hasn't had the formal education. He's had to teach himself. And that's been a hampering. And the same with Bunyan, to some degree. So Owen, Owen is very well acquainted with the entire history of, of theology. And so when he's engaging in our discussions and arguments, he, he knows something of the flow of discussion. Um, secondly, I think Owen, because of his emphasis on the spirit, I, and here I, I'll be free, free to admit my, my bias, there are certain uh, uh, writers I hardly ever read. Uh, I hardly ever read William Perkins, for instance, as a Puritan writer. I, I couldn't figure out early on as I started to read the Puritans why there were some Puritans I found I gravitated towards and others I didn't. And I began to see that some of the Puritans, their focus is the, the reconstitution of Christendom and society. And other Puritans are much more concerned with the work of the Spirit in the, in the life of the church and in the individual. And that's, Owen's one of those. So I find that attractive. Owen's emphasis on the Spirit drew me to him. Um, and that, that informs, even, even when you've got sentences that are tough to go through, there, there often is, as you're working through it, suddenly there's a gem, a spiritual gem that relates to the to a, a biblical truth that is tied into spiritual experience. So I think Owen's, Owen's understanding of Christian spirituality is so rich. Um, and then... Yeah, I, I, as I said, I, I think, I think um, The Glory of Christ, which is one of his last books... Um, the mortification of sin in believers, uh, the Holy Spirit, and uh, Christian focus have what they've done is they've prepared these editions of Owen, in which they've 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 they've, they've attractively put them together in in nicer fonts, paragraphs. The Banner of Truth edition, they didn't have money, but they 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 should have re reset them, I think. I, I, I don't, they, they're using a mid 19th century Victorian font, which is not as, not as attractive to late 20th century uh, audiences. So those would, those would be some. I, I should mention, and I, I'm, I've mentioned a number of my biases here, uh, the 18th century I find 
even more appealing. And um, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones used to say he was an 18th century man, not a 17th century man. And when I first came across that, I thought, I don't know, what, it, what on earth is he talking about? And I think I know exactly what he's talking about. Um, the 18th century, one of the challenges of the Puritans, and I think bridge is a challenge here, and I quoted a quote, um, one of the challenges of the Puritans is that they generally believe that the New Testament contains a blueprint of how to do church. And I think by the time you get to the end of the Puritan era, I think that they're frustrated and they're realizing if, it, if the blueprint is there, why after 150 years haven't we found it? And I, I think the reality is this, I, I'll be honest, I don't think the blueprint is there in the detail they want. Now, I'm, I'm sure you can, you're free to disagree with me. And I think the 18th century man recognized that there are different ways of doing church, our term, but, and that, that diversity is accommodated by God and there has to be then within the people of God a flexibility and a recognition that others may do church differently from us, but we have to recognize that they can be as spiritually empowered and richly, as, as richly blessed as us. And therefore, the 18th century men have a Catholicity at times. And I think the classic example in the, on the Puritans is Baxter and Owen. And they didn't like each other. And they didn't like each other right from the get-go. And that, that dislike, they were the two big men. And that really hurt the Puritans. They, they, they could not agree to work together. Part of, it was, part of it was ecclesiological. Baxter was a Presbyterian, and he was hoping somehow that the, the national church would re-admit all the Presbyterians. Owen had given up on the idea of the national church. So some of it was ecclesiological, but some of it was also they just didn't like each other. And, um, and I think that that gets tied into this whole idea of trying to find a blueprint. In the 18th century, you have personality clashes again, but there's a Catholicity there. The, the downside of the 18th century is the understanding of the church starts to suffer. So, you've got a George Whitfield, who I know preached in Norwich. Be interesting, did he preach here? I'd be very surprised if Whitfield didn't preach here. It'd be fascinating to know if he... I think he preached in the Octagon Chapel. It'd be fascinating to know if he preached here. He, he's not interested in ecclesiology at all. He's interested in the new birth and holiness. But he's not interested in ecclesiology. So, anyway, I'm rambling at this point. I, I, and I think, I, I think the thing I like about the 18th century is the outpouring of the Spirit. So you have these remarkable scenes of George Whitfield coming to a town like this, and there's 8,000 people come to hear him. And half of them don't know why they're there. They're just drawn there. And, uh, anyway... Any other questions before our brother? Okay. <laughs> well, Robert Robinson was here preaching in that chapel. And uh, I just found out today Robert Robinson was baptized in Great Ellingham which I didn't realize. Yeah. Um, I understand there's a, there's a growing interest in Puritan, in the Puritans. Can you give us some examples in Puritan College and you're seeing all of this? Are you seeing a growth of interest? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's enormous. Yeah. Uh, the growth? Uh, well, first of all, I think you have, the, you know, in the beginnings, it was the 1960s with the Banner of Truth. 
And then over in the United States, there were a number of publishers as well. Um, Evangelical Press on the side of the Atlantic, Christian Focus to some degree. In the States, Crossway. Uh, Crossway is deeply linked to John Piper. I mean, Piper, people, you know, people like Piper, uh, MacArthur, R.C. Sproul. I mean, they have enormous influence. So next month, the Gospel Coalition, which is linked with um, uh, Piper, uh, well, Piper and uh, R.C. Sproul and D.A. Carson. I mean, they've got a conference in Indianapolis, and uh, I think it's sold out. I think it's 5,000, 6,000 people. And uh, Crossway will be there, and they'll give away they'll give away twenty to thirty books to every participant, and uh, five to seven of them will be Puritans. And uh, I've seen this building for the last twenty twenty five years. I remember I had a student you wouldn't and nobody here would know him. His name's Tim Kerr. He was a missionary to Japan for about twelve years, and now works in Canada in a kind of mentoring discipling of pastors. And um, his father and his grandfather were just kind of flaming Arminians. And I remember Tim coming to me and said, uh, about 1983, he said, you know, I'm really, I'd really like somebody to read. Who, who do you think, you know? I said, why don't you start reading Owen? Well, he's read everything. He just took that advice and he's just basically read the entire corpus of Owen. And he's a, he's a walking encyclopedia of John Owen. And uh, I started to see that among young men. They were, they were fed up with the, some of the, for lack of a better word, the kind of shallow pablum theologically of the 20th century. And they started to go back to the Puritans. And, uh, I mean, Banner of Truth conferences in the 40s and 50s, uh, you know, would have had 40, 50 men. Uh, together for the Gospel, last year, there were... 9,000. And pretty well most of the people who spoke would be advocates of the Puritans to some degree. So I I think what's happened among evangelicalism, I think this is one of the encouraging signs in in evangelicalism, is the Puritans are being read. And when the Puritans were read in the 18th century, there was revival. And I'm encouraged by that. There can be a downside to that, too. I, I think if we, to be honest, I think if we get hung up on the, the search for an ecclesiological blueprint with all the details, I, I think it's going to hurt us. But that's partly my own. That's my own read. But I, I think by the end of the Puritan era in the 1690s, you know, a number of the Puritans were asking God, why, 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 what? Why did, why did the whole thing go to seed? And I think a lot of it was the dissensions among them and their, their inability to, to, to maintain a Catholicity despite ecclesiological differences. And that's the reason why to study history. We, we should learn from that. Well, there was another question here. Uh, n- yes and no. Um, I-, I think I-, I think I must have something of a photographic memory when it comes to things like this. I can I can remember books. I can remember their front covers and where they are in libraries. But then I I, I can't remember sometimes students' names I met last year. <laughs> so. Uh, I, I think I have a degree of photographic memory. Um, I yeah, I think two. Th- no, I think two or three things. First of all, most most of you aren't going to be historians, so remembering all the dates and that is not as important. Uh, dates are important. They're the, the, in some ways, they're the bones of history. So history is, is tracing cause and effect and why. Why did this happen? 
And so, uh, for instance, if you don't know that the First World War preceded the rise of Nazi Germany, uh, it's going to be a problem because the First World War plays into the rise of Nazi Germany. Um, yeah, I, th I think uh, I think you asked me if I had any hobbies. Uh, I mean, my hobby is to read. I just read different types of history, um, lighter history. Um, uh, and when I'm reading that, I'm not necessarily taking notes. But when, I, when I'm reading for what I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I heavily annotate books. Uh, I don't use underline. I don't use. Um, I use underlining. I don't use white. Uh, li uh, the highlighter. I don't like that because it bleeds. Uh, but I do annotate in the margin to remember. I create my own index sometimes at the back of the book. Um, and different people learn differently. My wife uh, is very much oral, so she'll listen. I, I don't like listening to tapes. So I, I ask normally you know, the people send me the web link. Uh, I never listen to them. I put them up because people tell me, you know, I'd like to hear your talk. Well, you know, I'm not going to listen to it. Um, people will give me all kinds of tapes to listen to. I, I never listen to them. Um, I rarely, so I don't learn that way. When I'm in the car, I never listen. I, I like silence in the car. Or... <laughs> Confession time. I really love classical rock music. So, <laughs> so Led Zeppelin, Eric Clapton, Blind Faith. I mean, that stuff just, I put all. <laughs> um, uh, so, I, I rarely listen to stuff like that. And I, I don't normally, I don't normally watch historical uh, programs, documentaries. Uh, when I watch something, it's, I like, it's going to be entertainment. So I watch a historical movie or something like that. But we all learn differently. My wife, she learns, it took her a long time to figure out. Yes, she, she, she just doesn't learn it by reading. She has to hear it. So we have, you have to know how you learn. But I think one of the things I'm doing in a thing like this today, uh, I, I don't necessarily want you to go away of all the details about William Bridge or John Owen. I, I want you to have a realization that history is important for you as a Christian. And that you will go away and start to take it, it'll be part of your life. And you'll be interested in history. Of, of the church and the history of your local church and the history of Christians. Um, I, a lot of what I do at seminary, not at the PhD level, but at the master's level, which is really like a bachelor's degree, because they'll do a bachelor's degree and then come do an MDiv. Those students come in there into you know first year church history survey one, and I know most of them, history's not History is not something they like, they love. They take it. They're there to study the Bible. They take church history one and church history two because it's in the curriculum. And they've had, they've had history in high school, and usually in history in high school is by some guy, he's a phys ed teacher, and he, they, <laughs> he has to do something else. So he does history, and it's been a bad experience. And what I, my goal is to have them go out of there with a realization that history is important to them as a Christian and they need to know something about history and to get a love for history. So. And is there any other questions before we conclude? Thank you.